All right, so welcome to today's session of Open Texas 2022. I am Whitney Johnson Freeman with the Open Texas Conference Committee, and I will be moderating the session. Thank you all for joining us today for increasing scientific literacy and diversity-based discussions by utilizing peer-reviewed scientific articles at no cost to the students. And I'll go ahead and hand it off to the presenter. Hello, everyone. My name is Sharon Eves. I'm a professor of psychology at Collin College in McKinney, Texas. I am so glad for the opportunity to be able to tell you about something I've been doing in my classes that I hope you will also kind of see the benefits of and, and if you're a faculty member, be able to incorporate some of, of these ideas. So one of the big themes that the conference has tried to focus on is how do we increase diversity, inclusion, um, those from different backgrounds, accessibility in our open educational courses. Um, so I've, I've thought about this and um, th this is one of the solutions that, that I have come up with is that I have done this by incorporating scientific journal articles, which I want to tell you about a little bit more in a minute. But first, I want you to each kind of start by thinking about your own time as a student. So when you were attending a college or university, what courses did you take that really highlighted the importance of diversity, how diversity worked, what the differences between different groups of people were? Um, so which courses helped you with your understanding the most? Um, secondly, how was diversity? brought into the discussion? How did that kind of conversation happen in the classroom? And thirdly, um, do you remember any textbook readings that encouraged you to consider how culture and individual differences may have related to the main focus of the course? Uh, because, you know, with, with OER, a lot of times we are talking about textbook resources. And so I just wonder if any of you have memories of oh yeah i was reading this textbook and i saw this thing that represented diversity that represented um, people from from different backgrounds or how culture impacted them so you might want to take a um, copy paste of these questions or take a screenshot so that you can talk about this in some breakout rooms i'm, I'm going to go ahead and send you off and in, into some breakout rooms for about um seven minutes. If you feel like your discussion wraps up earlier than that, feel free to rejoin the main group, but, but you'll be assigned to these breakout rooms where you can discuss how this has worked and bring back what kind of big themes have come out of your small group discussions. So I'm going to go ahead and ask Whitney to send everybody in, into some breakout rooms. Welcome back, everybody. I'm so glad that we had that experience. I actually joined one of the breakout rooms. We had a great discussion, but I wanted to kind of give it to y'all. Um, take turns, unmute, and tell us kind of what you discovered as a group. What were the big themes? I don't know that we had a, a major theme from our discussion, um, but um, we talked about how diversity is is uh, not about minimizing one person or one group of people, but just magnifying all voices and make sure everyone um, has can be heard, and also not lumping even groups together like we we sometimes say Native Americans as if that's one group of people, or even like we'll talk about people quote in Africa as if Africa is like one tiny little country. Um, and uh, we can't be doing that. Like we have to be cognizant of the fact that there's many groups of people in, uh, in, in these larger groups and um, just be careful the way we talk about people. Exactly. Thank you for sharing. 
Anybody else? Ours were primarily focused on social sciences okay. um, is when we rich, you know, got exposure to that. Great. Great. As a psychologist, yeah, yeah, I can I can see that. For, for me, it was actually a literature class, though, that really kind of brought it home for me because it was an elective and we got to cover literature from another group that that was just amazing to me. Um, who, who else has has a comment, something to add? Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and move on, but please feel free to add some some things to the chat. Um, the economics of discrimination, very, very good course that you took at UTA. That's great. Um, that there, there is a lot of economics in, involved with how discrimination affects people differently. Um, great, great. So let's let's go ahead and keep moving forward. Um, so here, here was my big idea. I felt like most textbooks, even those that argue that they're including DEI don't actually do a good job. In, in my opinion, most of these textbooks just have, you know, pictures of people who look different as, as decorative images on, on the, the pages. Maybe they'll have like a little section, a, a half a page that highlights somebody from a different culture, but very rarely do they spend a significant amount of time actually bringing in how culture influences the way that we see the world and the way that we interact with others. Now, many fields, psychology being one of them, have recognized what is called the WEIRD problem. Um, WEIRD is an acronym. It stands for Western, Educated, Industrialized, Rich, and Democratic. And I am WEIRD um, for more reasons than just that I fit the acronym. Um, but this, this was a term first used by Henrik Hein and Nora Zayn in 2010. And at that point in their article, they wrote that in their analysis of published psychology research from the databases they had access to, 96% of psychological samples came from weird groups, which meant that that's only 12% of the world's population represented in 96% of the studies. And so psychology has kind of said, okay, this is a problem. We, we need to do something to really represent people from other parts of the world. And one of the benefits of using scientific articles as a substitute for textbook readings, um, in my lifespan development class, I actually don't have a textbook. Their scientific articles are their reading assignments. And I found that this has worked out great. Um, you can choose that researchers can be highlighted who come from a variety of backgrounds so that students can see themselves in the people who are the researchers. Because so often we get into this trap of talking about like the historically significant figures who are almost always weird. And we don't bring up the more modern examples of people who look like them, who have similar cultural backgrounds similar gender, similar um, socioeconomic statuses, things like that. And, and so we can highlight different researchers. Um, we can also choose who are the participants in our studies if we're using something in um, research with human participants. Um, and, and that's what I've done. I've picked studies particularly focused on having a variety of cultures from around the world represented in the studies so that students can kind of start to understand how diversity plays a role. And also, you know, we're elevating this research to say this is important that we study people from different backgrounds because that makes a big difference in our understanding of how people work. Um, so the, the basic idea then is that students are encouraged to read the articles on their own. Then we come together to discuss the articles and how those articles relate to their own experiences. Um, Colin College actually has quite a diverse group of students, 
And it's always really fun for me to be able to say, okay, this is what the study found about this group of people. Are there anybody, is there anybody in the room that can identify with these groups or knows something about these groups that can add to our discussion? Um, that there have been many times where the, the students, because the people in the, the research studies have a similar background to what they have, they've been able to add some context that really helps us all to understand and appreciate it more. Um, and the reason I'm here at the Open Texas is that the students have access to all of these databases. So all of these articles are actually free to them to use as reading assignments because they've already paid for it as part of you know the library purchases access to these journal articles. And so my students pay nothing for their reading assignments that they're going to use in class and hopefully gain a lot out of. So, so that's kind of the basic where I'm going. Let, let's let's talk about the steps. Where, where do you start? Um, usually, I would recommend that if you want to use research articles instead of textbook content, the first step is to identify maybe five to 10 important topics from your course that they would need to learn about beyond typical textbook content. So I still will cover most of the major theorists in the lecture side of the class, but then I might take something like Piaget's cognitive stages of development. He has this concept of theory of mind, how we understand other people. And I take that concept and I go find research, search peer reviewed journal databases for articles that focus on theory of mind. And so when I'm looking, once I hit my search terms in, I'm looking for journals that are, first of all, peer reviewed. You know, most of them, the time you have a little checkbox, make sure it's peer reviewed. Um, the, the next thing I do is, is look for a di diversity of researchers and participants. I want to pick articles that they're going to bring something to the table that my students typically would not see in the content of the class. So I'm looking for diversity. I'm also looking for the writing style. Not everybody writes equally well. And, and since my class is at a community college, these are sophomores, generally speaking, it's a 2000 level class. Um, I want something that's written very concretely, concisely, that, that the students are going to be able to make it through the article. Um, so that means that there's some really great articles out there that use so much technical jargon that I can't really feel comfortable assigning that to my class because the students are going to get lost and then they're just going to give up. So, so I want to I want to make sure that the writing style is written in, in a way that my students are going to be able to get most of it, not everything, but most of it and understand what's going on. I also look for overall length. Generally speaking, for my students, I will pick articles that are between 10 and 12 pages long. Why? Because those are the shorter articles in psychology. Um, you may want to consider, you know, is it more typical in your field to have brief reports be five to six pages long? Um, th this is one of my selling points for my students is that, you know, I'm giving them six assigned readings that are each about 10 pages long, so they only have to read 60 pages for the entire semester, whereas if I gave them a textbook to read instead, they would be reading hundreds of pages once I assigned everything to them. And, and so that, that's one of the things that I like to do, but also keeping them to shorter articles means that we can get more in depth with that single article and we're not just rushing through trying to hit the, the high points. And then the last thing that I try to always do is, is look for recent articles. Pick things that have been published in the last 10 to 15 years. The more recent, the better, ideally. But I, I want to I hit things that are more recent, and, and that has two purposes. Purpose number one is that, you know, since psychology has this weird problem, I'm going to be able to find more diverse articles in the last five to 10 years than I would if I were to use the entire time span of when people were publishing articles on this topic. Um, but additionally, more recent articles are kind of the big headlines. Like the, these are the, the things that are new and exciting in the field. And so I want my students to feel like what they're getting is not old news. 
It's, it's something that they're going to really like see where the cutting edge research is being done. So once I've picked out the articles, assigned them the articles, there, there needs to be time where you introduce these articles as a reading assignment to the students and let them know the why. Um, one, one of the things I found over and over again with working with students is if you just tell them to do something, a lot of them are internally going to question that and think, well, why do I need to do this? This is a waste of my time. This is not anything useful to my everyday life. And for some assignments, I, I could say, yeah, maybe it doesn't apply to your everyday life. But by giving them kind of a frame of reference for why I want them to do this, I can really impact their motivation to improve it, hopefully, so, so that they'll get more out of it. And I can also um, help them to understand what, what they're doing, why they're doing this in the, in, the, in the first place, what my goals are. So when I introduce these articles as reading assignments, I always make sure to, to tell students that I don't expect them to understand all of it. I want them to practice and keep working on it because this is a skill. You know, reading a textbook is a skill too, but most of us don't read textbooks every day once we graduate and get out into the real world. But with these research articles, science is going to continue to communicate primarily with these journal articles for the indefinite future. And so this is something that they can take outside of the class and still find beneficial when they learn the skill of how to read it. So it's okay to struggle. Struggling is expected. And so they, they don't give up too quickly when they do struggle. So, so first I set up the expectation. I do expect them to struggle at first. They're gonna get better with practice. Secondly, I tell them that learning the skill of reading articles can improve their lives and education beyond this course. And, and I do have a personal story. I'm going to try to keep it brief, but, but to share with you why this is important beyond just a college course. Um, so when I was pregnant with my son, he, he's eight now, but when I was pregnant with him, I went in for, for the typical 20 week ultrasound and everything was going great. And then the, the sonographer got really quiet and she's like, um, I'm going to be just right back. She goes out, gets the doctor, brings the doctor in. They confer in the corner, looking at the screen. It's all very concerning. And then the doctor tells me that, you know, there, there's a potential issue with one of my son's kidneys. It's just not the right size. It's outside of their normal range. And they're concerned he could be developing this condition. And so they're going to schedule me to go way far away from where I live, like a three hour drive to get a um, MRI done for my unborn child. To, to see if, if this was actually a thing or if it was just like a, a, an issue with the, the ultrasound that day. So as any mother would, I was kind of freaking out. I'm like, what is wrong with my child? What would happen with this? And so because I had the training to know about the research articles, I start looking up research articles on this condition that the doctor says my son might have. And I find very quickly that the measurement that my son had actually puts him right on the border of this potential condition. Reading more articles, I find that something like 93% of, of, of um, fetuses who show this, this measurement, they grow out of it. So by the time they're born, it's no longer an issue. It's not a problem at all. They never have any, any need for interventions or treatments because they grow out of it. And I learned through reading that there's absolutely nothing the doctors can do until after he's born anyways. So even if he did have it, it would still be several more weeks before any type of treatment could be done. So I take all of that together. I go back to the doctor. Well, I call actually, and I'm like, yeah, I just read all of this. And based on the, the measurement you gave me, my son is on the border. There's nothing we can do about it. I'm not driving three hours to get this test done. That's going to be expensive and time consuming because I think he'll be fine. And we're going to do another ultrasound anyways later on. We can figure out then if we need to do any more. And she goes, that's a perfectly reasonable 
explanation of, of your stance and I'm fine with that. But I had to tell you and send you, refer you for this extra test because if I didn't, then I would be liable if something bad did happen, people could sue me. But I tell my students this because, you know, when you understand how to look up the actual research, you can find out things that the doctor may not have told you up front, and you can understand about therapies and treatments that your doctor may not be familiar with, and you can advocate for yourself and your loved ones in a way that you simply can't do if you don't know the research. And so being able to read a research article and gain things from it will help you in all sorts of different areas of life when things come up, because things always will. And I also tell them there are tricks. There are places that you can always go to find specific information. And so the students don't need to get bogged down in all the details, but they, they can um, use these tricks to get the main points out, the things that they really need to know. So once I've introduced the articles to the students, given them, assigned them, okay, we're gonna have um, a day where we discuss this in class, all of us together. Here are the reading anchors that I would give them so that they know that they're getting out what they need to. Um, these seven questions, why did the researchers need or want to conduct the study? What are the hypotheses or goals for the study? Who were the participants? How many participated? Were there any exclusionary criteria? So I really do focus in on who were the participants. Based on those participants, how do we generalize this research? Because I want them to, to understand that who participated is a big deal to understanding the research as a whole. Um, were the participants divided into groups? If so, how were they divided? What was the independent variable? So this is where they get kind of their research methods. Was it a true or pseudo independent variable? And they learn how to tell the difference with, with random assignment or it's a pseudo independent variable because especially with lifespan age group is a big pseudo independent variable. Um, so so they, they learn how to use these terms. What were the dependent variables? Um, what did the participants do or experience in the study? Any named questionnaires, tests? And then finally, what, what were the main findings? In fact, as I'm going through and showing these the students the, the tricks for how to find the information, I often tell them that the results section is often going to be written in language that is heavily based on statistics, which because they haven't had a class in yet, they're just not going to understand it very well. So generally speaking, they should skip the results section. The only thing in the results section that they should attend to are the, the tables and the figures that they do understand, because if they re read the methods, they should be able to have a good idea what's going on in the tables and the figures but otherwise just skip and go to the main, the discussion of the article to get those main findings out. Um, so they, they start with some, some anchors for, for what they need to be trying to find in the article. Then once, once they've done their reading, they come in and, and we, I usually dedicate at least 45 minutes to discussing the article that they have. I'll probably start with some background information. Some of these do use some, some um, research methods or some terminology that's going to be unfamiliar that they may have stumbled on. I'll give them tips for reading. So, okay, they use this abbreviation throughout the article. I'm going to write in the margins real big what that abbreviation means so that every time I come across, I'm like, wait, what, do, what is that again? I can just go to where I wrote it and it's going to stand out and be easy to find. Um, I do have students provide summary and proof that they read the article. In fact, if I'm doing it virtually, I will send small groups into breakout rooms and they each have an assignment to provide a summary for one of those seven questions. Um, if we're doing it in person, I'll divide them into small groups and give them assignments, sometimes two. So one to two of the, the anchor questions. And that helps me to see that, first of all, they read it. So I'm just not going to tell them the whole thing, like the answers to everything. I'm going to require that they provide some proof. Now, it would be pretty easy to do a quiz as well for, for this type of thing if you didn't want to take the time to have the students provide their summary. But because students don't always do their reading assignments, 
usually at least one person in the group has and they can help teach the other students where to find the information what's the key thing to look for and and so the students provide basically a summary i have them present it to the whole class i'll either have them write everything on the board or go one by one or sometimes i'll use a word document that they can add their notes to together a, a google doc um, they can add their notes up together i'll review their summary with them praising what they got right saying hey yes you found this important point this, this is what we need to be looking at and then trying to make some gentle corrections to anything that they didn't get quite right um especially with the technical term terminology of independent and dependent variable a lot of times students will get them backwards or won't be quite sure and, and so making some general corrections so that they end up with an accurate summary and then I try to prepare some questions in advance to spark discussion about the diversity aspect. So talking about, okay, these participants, what would their lives be like outside of this study? How might that influence the way that they see the study itself? How they interact with the researchers? What kind of controls did you notice the researchers making to try to accommodate people from different backgrounds? And so we, we have some discussion. I try to encourage students who have direct knowledge from the groups that we talk about to add, add their, their take on and their perspective on how the article presented these groups. So we, we have the discussion. It usually goes really well. Students feel like they really understand it after they're done. And we've spent a lot of time talking about the diversity aspect. So, so there, it's not always perfect though. There are some definite challenges to using journal articles as reading assignments. The, the first one is that some students aren't gonna read. No matter how much weight you put on, on their summaries and being able to discuss it, some, some students are gonna come unprepared. And part of that has to do with how chaotic many of their lives are, how busy they are. Um, I, at the community college, I have, so many students who are also parents. I have students who work full-time jobs and then take full-time classes. I have students who are struggling with mental health issues. And so all of those factors are gonna influence the time that they have to do this, even when they want to, sometimes they just don't. Hopefully though, when they come to class, even though they're unprepared, they will gain enough from their classmates, from their classmates discussion of the articles that they'll still benefit from attending and from us having these articles as their assigned reading. Um, some articles are more complex than others. I, I try to put one of the, the easiest to read up first in the semester and then maybe sprinkle in one or two that are more difficult later on in the semester when they've gained some of those skills to understand what's going on and they've developed the perseverance to keep going. Um, pronunciation is, a, is a, an issue occasionally because I can't always pronounce the names correctly of the authors and sometimes the, the groups of people included, I may not be familiar with how to reference them. And in this case, I try to rely on my students. I, I do have a lot of students from different backgrounds. And so if I know a student comes from a similar place as the article or as one of the authors, I'll ask them, hey, how would you pronounce this? And try to learn myself how to do a better job with that. It's also important to note, articles don't always age very well. So, I'm, I'm constantly like reviewing which articles I choose and then updating, like picking new ones just here and there so that um, they're getting a good experience from it and not reading something going, oh, that was so long ago. Things don't really work that way anymore. So, so those are some challenges and some things that I've done to try to deal with those challenges. Um, definite payoffs from this method students who haven't read will still gain an appreciation whether they read or not having the discussion is going to benefit them benefit number two student learn students learn why a google search is not research so many of our students are not taught actual researching skills in k through 12 and so they think that if they want to research something they just do a google search 
Well, when you realize that these articles represent real research, you realize how a Google search is really inadequate. What you're getting with a Google search a lot of times are people's opinions, talking heads. When you're using research articles, you're looking at something that's peer reviewed that others in the field have appreciated and say, yes, this is valuable, it needs to be published. And these individuals are experts on the areas that they're publishing in. So scientific literacy, yay. Um, students also see that I value and respect those from other cultures and backgrounds. Um, one, one of the things we talk about is how parenting styles differ based on culture. And when they hear me say, you know, they do it really differently in these other countries, but it's not worse. It's not like we've got the, the um, patent on how to be the best parent. There are other ways to do it that are equally good. And I think it makes them feel validated that, you know, if what they experience is not the same as what, you know, typically is considered the best parenting styles in the U.S., that doesn't mean that what they experienced was not good as well. So, so they feel valued and respected and they gain some value and respect for people from other cultures and backgrounds because I've modeled that, I hope, for them, how, how to value and respect these differences. And then finally, students feel accomplished when they get to the end of the semester and they're like, it took me several articles, but now I can, I just know where to look. I know what to look for. And I feel like I'm really understanding a lot more. That That's an, an amazing feeling that students have gained this skill through reading six articles in a class. Uh, so some of, some of my favorite articles, and, and then we'll do um, some comments and questions. Um, this is an article, Gillis et al., um, from to 2021, looking at racial disparities in adolescent sleep duration. They are particularly doing research in Alabama. And so we have um, adolescents in the Deep South comparing Black versus white students and looking at how physical activity is important. Um, one, of, one of the big headlines for this article was that in the, the black adolescents, there was a much bigger payoff. They got much more sleep when they had physical activity during the day. For the white students, it was more even. There was less of a benefit from the um, physical activity. Here, here's another one. Um, that This has been a recent favorite of mine, Burdette et al., looks at the minds of gods, mortals, and in between children's developing understanding of Ordinary, extraordinary and ordinary minds across four countries. Those four countries include uh, the Dominican Republic, Israel, Kenya, and the UK, um, Great Britain. And, and so this, I, I just feel is an amazing study because it talks about how beliefs differ in these different countries and then how that is seen in children's understanding of what God knows or their beliefs about what God knows. So this relates back to kind of theory of mind research. Um, another one, aging and long-term memory for emotionally valenced events. This is an older study, but this was done with a community sample. Um, baseball fans in um, the Boston area generally were asked about their memories. And so we get to look at how older fans may differ from younger fans. And in this study, they don't give a lot of demographic data about the participants because it's a brief report. And so I asked the students to kind of guess, to think about like, what do you think the demographics would be for this type of group? How might that limit the generalizability of this research? And then finally, um, Ethnicity and Gender in Late Childhood and Early Adolescence by um, Brown et al. And in this article, they are located in Los Angeles, excuse me, where they did the research. And in Los Angeles, you have a significant group of um, children who come from Hispanic backgrounds, children who come from African-American backgrounds, and children who come from white backgrounds. And we're comparing their awareness of their own identity and of bias occurring in the community and what that bias looks like. And so I, I always find this article really interesting to talk about 
in a group of full a room full of students that also represent these different backgrounds and how their cultural beliefs and their interactions with others have influenced their beliefs about their own um, identity and, and how that's formed. So, so those are some of my favorites. Um, that's that's what I've got in terms of presentation material. I do have a reference slide if you're interested in any of those articles, finding out more about them. But I want to open it up. Are there any questions or comments that any of you have? He, he's eight. He's taller than we expected, but totally healthy. Never, never had a kidney problem. <laughs> Anything else? Have, have any of you tried having students read scientific journal articles and how has that gone? Yeah, just just using the textbook. I, I can I can totally, you know, see how that would happen. I'm glad. I hope you try them out. Let me know how it goes. I'll put my email in, in the chat. So if any of you have other questions you'd prefer to discuss with me outside of this venue, that would be great. Um Sharon, I really appreciate the there's like an information literacy component to all this too that we've seen the past two and a half years especially with um so much misinformation about the pandemic and when you were talking about what you did with your son and you you immediately went to peer review journal articles there's uh, a lot of people are, are going straight to google and now i've, I've been reading um recently um uh, people are going um to TikTok and YouTube before Google, which is like, it's bonkers to me. Like, Even you, worse. yeah, like, why would you go to TikTok for a search? But Google's business model is going to be changing because people are going to TikTok as their first place to search for actual information. Mm -hmm. And you can't find peer reviewed anything on TikTok, mm -hmm. but it's, it's where people are going, unfortunately. And so it's just, it's an uphill battle, I guess, but we're doing good my work. students, they know how to find. <laughs> good. <laughs> good. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you, Amber. Um, intentionally using some of the older research to talk about the importance of the, the crack test um, for research literacy. Um, let's see. Do I remember currency? Uh, Amber, remind us what the crap stands for. Currency, relevance, authority, accuracy, and purpose. Yes. Yes. We, we've got to teach our students these skills. They need them. It makes the world a better place when, when they can actually, actually fact check things that have been studied in, in the, the science world. And, you know, with all the plus one articles available that, that are now um, the open access articles in science, it's getting easier and easier for everyday people to, to also find research that's relevant to their questions, even if they don't have a database at a college or university to use. Let we still have a few minutes, but I was going to go ahead and post the link to um, your presentation materials so that people can save these things and reference them later. Great, thank you, Whitney. So please feel, feel free to, you know, download the slides, use them as you will with attribution, please. But that, that's all I ask, a little bit of, little bit of attribution. Remix, whatever you like. Any other comments? Questions?
I really enjoyed your presentation, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> All right, I guess I guess that's it. Have have a great weekend, y'all. Thanks, everybody. Because I'm from Texas, and y'all is a real word. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Sharon, um, and thank you, attendees, for um, attending this presentation. And I hope you have a great rest of the conference um, and a great weekend. <laughs>